Good morning, Bridgepoint. It's good to be together this morning. We invite you to stand wherever you're joining us from. And we sing this morning because we have a great and glorious God. So let's with together in one voice declare his goodness. worthy of all of our prey. He's, he is the magnificent. He is the strong God. And so it is that posture that we come to him. And in a life that is chaotic, a life that sometimes can feel out of control, when sometimes our tendency is to want to grab on, there's the invitation to let go. Because we have a God who is worthy of our praise. He is our firm foundation. And so we can say, God, I don't have to live this life in my own strength, but I look to you and I trust you. You are Lord of my life. With that, let's continue to sing our praises to him this morning. It's not my life to live. It's not my song. It's not my righteousness. 
God, is with that that we come to you. Your word says that we can trust in you in all our ways, acknowledge you, lean not on our own understanding. And God, we just pray that we would come to you with that posture today, trusting you. Pray that you would open our hearts to hear from you. God, be exalted through our worship. Set our minds back on you, King of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. If I haven't met you yet, my name's Bailey, and I've served here at Bridgepoint in our student ministry and on our prayer team, and I'm really excited to be with you this morning. We're going to transition now into a time of giving, and I really love the song that we just sang that says, Let my yes be yes to you, O Lord, and let my no be no to the things of this world. Because those words remind us that when we're following Jesus, we do it with our whole life. Not just the parts of it that feel natural or normal or comfortable, but all of it. And that includes our finances. And in Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 9, it tells us that two good things can come from giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God as a result of your ministry, for they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. What that means is that when we give obediently to the church, God's mission gets to move forward. So we're going to invite you to give. You can do that a couple different ways. We have giving boxes in the back of the auditorium, so you can prepare your gifts and drop those there as you leave. Or you can give online at our website, bpri.church backslash give. We're going to take some time now to reflect and pray and prepare your gifts. Good morning again. If you're new here, we're so excited that you're here. We would love to meet you. So stop by the Next Steps corner in the back of the lobby as you leave. We have a small gift there for you and we'd love to just say hi and get you connected. Here at Bridgepoint, we're also a family who prays for each other. So if there's anything you need prayer for or support for, take a second to fill out the connect card in the back of the seat back in front of you and drop it in the giving box as you leave. We'd love to pray for you. A couple of announcements. We have a ton of small groups and classes starting up this week and next. And I can say from experience that being a part of a small group has been the most fun and nourishing and life-giving thing for my faith. Um, we're never called to follow Jesus alone. In fact, we're designed to be in community with other people. And that's exactly what a small group is. It gives you the chance to connect with others and feel supported and prayed for and held accountable. So check, those, check out those out online. They're all listed there. And maybe you're thinking, I'm not quite ready to commit to the long-term commitment of a small group. And if that's you, or if you just want to learn more about how to study scripture or what it means to follow Jesus, we have a ton of classes launching this week and next. So just to name a couple of those, we're going to have a Bible lab that starts this Tuesday, the three-week class led by Jared that's going to walk you through the basics of studying scripture. We also have a new class that Jess Eunick is going to be leading called The Spirit-Filled Life, where you will learn all about who the Holy Spirit is. And lastly, we'll have a Rooted class that starts up two weeks from now. Um, and Rooted is just a really awesome program that walks you through step-by-step step what it means to follow Jesus. So these are all really incredible classes. And if you have any questions about those, talk to Keith as you leave or check them out online. All right, I think that's it. So we're going to hear from the Word of God and continue in our series, Far From Home. Good morning, church. Try this again. My name is Mike Lacklade. I'm one of the student leaders here at Bridgepoint. In today's scripture, we're going to be in Daniel 2, uh, verses 24 through 35. When Daniel went to Arioch, 
whom the king had appointed to execute the, the, the wise men of Babylon and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dreams mean. King asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel, Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that, you, that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a thrashing, threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Hey, Bridgepoint. Good morning. It is good to be together. We want to welcome those who are with us online. If you are here in the room, give someone around you a smile or a wave to let them know you're glad they're here. Uh, it is so good to be here, to be back. I missed you all last week. Uh, if you are brand new, my name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor here. We want to welcome you to the Bridgepoint family as we prepare to continue the series that has some funky music. Uh, I want to take just a moment of silence um, because we've said this before, your readiness to listen is just as important as my readiness to speak. Like they've got to come together. And so I want to take just a moment of silence to give you the opportunity to prepare your heart and mind to say, Jesus, you are my king. Therefore, your word commands my life. So take just a moment right where you're at uh, to pray for God to help you to hear what he has for you to hear today. And then I'll, I'll pray to begin us. All right. Holy God, I pray that you would calm our hearts and clear our minds. I pray that my words would carry your wisdom and power, for mine is not enough. Pray that you are pleased by what happens in these moments. And use these words to shape our hearts and minds, to make us who you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in this series called Far From Home. Uh, it's a series that is really about maintaining our identity as the people of God and gaining influence so that more may know him in this world. So, so this series is coming out of the story of Daniel in the Old Testament, set about 600 years before Jesus came. And Daniel's situation has some similarities to ours, obviously not completely, but Daniel's situation was this. Uh, before he was on the scene, God had a special relationship with the people of Israel. He said, you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. And the way that you live for me and with me is going to show the whole world how good life is with me, how good I am as your king. But Israel repeatedly rejected God. They said, we want life apart from you. And that resulted in a culture, a nation that was defined, characterized by immorality, injustice, and idolatry. 
And God said, my name can't be on that. I don't want the world to think that that's who I am. And so after repeated warnings, God removed his presence and power from the nation of Israel and said, you have to stand on your own. And without God's protection, they were repeatedly invaded by foreign armies. This culminated in the invasion from the Babylonians in about 600, close to 600 BC. Babylon, over the course of 20 years, laid siege to the capital city of Jerusalem multiple times and finally destroyed it completely in 586 BC. So during these sieges, during this invasion, they would extract Jewish citizens take them off 700 miles to the nation of Babylon and have them, they human traffic them and have them as slaves, servants, and participants in their culture. So in one of the first waves of the exiles, uh, there, there was this special assignment. Someone from Babylon had to come and select the, the most impressive young men. And among them were Daniel and three friends of his. They were from the royal family of Israel and so they're taken to Babylon as captives. And they were put into this three-year program that was intended to prepare them for service to the king. This three-year program, as we talked about a couple years ago, or a couple weeks ago, this three-year program was to strip them of their Jewish identity, to separate them from their God, so that they, they would then become wholly and completely Babylonian. So it was a, really a process of acculturation. The whole idea, strip them of their God-related identity and replace that with a Babylonian identity. And so in the midst of this story, what we see is this central character, Daniel, maintaining his identity, being, being relentless in his commitment to God, and at the same time, rising to influence within this culture. He provides this template for us that we, that we should aspire to, that we would maintain our identity no matter what swirls around us. And at the same time, we would be blessed by God to have influence in this world so that the people around us see more of him through us. See, I think a lot of times it feels like we've got to choose between our identity and influence in this world, in this world that feels far from home, that feels like it's moving away from God, that feels less hospitable, less familiar, less comfortable, less safe to those who belong to Jesus feels like we've got to choose between identity and influence. That either we cling to our identity and therefore separate ourselves from the world or try to lean into the world for the sake of influence and lose who we are. And Daniel shows us a way forward to maintain identity and gain influence for the glory of God. And so that leads us to chapter two. This is the third week of the series. We're in chapter two of Daniel. I would love for you to turn there in one of the Bibles in the chairs around you, or maybe you brought your own, you wanna use your Bible app. This is a long story, and I wanna point out a few specific things as we move through it. So I'd love for you to open up and follow along. As you're turning there, I want to mention that we are encouraging you to read some of the Old Testament during this series. We've provided reading guides out in the lobby. We've got a bookmark that will guide you through several weeks of this series. Uh, so we're hoping that you would do that. If you don't know how to read the Bible, as Bailey mentioned, I would love for you to join me on Tuesday night in the Bible Lab class so I can walk you through that and we can learn together. As we get here, this story is happening during the three-year program that Daniel has been enlisted in. So he hasn't been in Babylon for very long. He's under pressure to give up his previous identity related to God to take on a new identity in Babylon. And it's during this time that really something significant happens that catapults Daniel into a position of influence. It's really amazing. And so what we're going to see throughout this story is that God is giving both Daniel and the king of Babylon this vision that is all about hope. And I think this is so timely for us. Hope is the certainty that the future is going to be okay. All right? It's not this wish, this dream, it's kind of bet on the future. Hope is the certainty that the future is going to be okay. And interestingly enough, while the two central characters in this story are on opposite ends of the spectrum, one is rich, one is poor, one is all in power, and one is a powerless slave. The two central figures in this story are both desperate for hope. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of, of Babylon, the most powerful man in the world, and yet he seems to have this paranoia this awareness that his kingdom is fragile 
and he wants to know that the future is going to be okay. Daniel is this, this human trafficked slave that has no power in his world. And he represents the people of Israel who've lost everything. And they, maybe more than any in this moment, need to have certainty and assurance that the future is going to be okay. So God gives this vision, this message about hope. And for us right now, I think we look around our world and it feels like there is so much that is shifting. It is hard to feel confident about the future. So whether we look at it from a political standpoint and we see all the turmoil and the arguing and the conflict and the division, or we look at it from an economic standpoint and we're dealing with inflation and the drop of investments, and, and, and it feels like the world is all out of order. Maybe you are experiencing this in conflict in different ways, or part of your life feels completely upended, and you look at the future, and you go, how do I know that the future is going to be okay? Like, we are a people who need hope in this moment. And there are things in this world that offer hope, or that look like hope at first. And, and so it's very easy for us to chase after those to attach ourselves to those. But what happens is that when we get close to those, when we see them for who they really are, what they really are, we see that they aren't what we thought they were. I had an experience like this this last week. So last week, I had the opportunity to travel to Southern California to visit one of the churches that we helped to start. Uh, it's called Church 180. It's in Southern California. During that trip, um, or on that trip, I took my daughter. She turned 13 this year. And so as a gift to her, we bought her a ticket to come along with me. And so we added an extra day, and on that day, her, uh, she and I, we, we took a trip to Disneyland. So we had a, a father-daughter day at Disneyland. It was super sweet. Um, she's really into Marvel movies right now, and so her favorite part of Disneyland was Avengers Campus. Uh, they, they have the Avengers characters placed throughout the area, you know, people, ordinary people like you and me dressed up like Captain America or Black Widow or Black Panther. And, and, and so it was super fun, and at one point we see Loki, Okay, from a distance. And I'm like, man, that guy is nailing it. He looks just like Loki. And so I got super excited. And I grabbed my phone, kind of jogged a little bit. And I was like, Loki, can I get a picture? And in this cool accent, he's like, if you can keep up. And I was like, I can keep up. So I jog up a little bit and I get in front of him and I snap this photo. And then I look at the picture and I'm like, he doesn't look like Loki at all. <laughs> right? Like, isn't that kind of disappointing? Like from a distance, I'm like, man, that guy is legit. But up close, I'm like, not even close. <laughs> and I think if you can stick with me here, I think this is what we do sometimes. That we look at something from a distance. We're like, man, that, that will make my future okay. And then we chase after it. We get close to it. And then we realize it's not what I thought. It's, it's not even close to the real thing. And so this vision that God gives to Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel then sees and interprets is all about making sure that we don't attach ourselves to the wrong hope, okay? And so this is going to get into our business a little bit, but we need that because it is devastating if we attach ourselves to the wrong hope, we get up close to it and realize that it's not what we thought it was. And so the hope is, the intention, I should say, of this message is that we would cling to the hope that will last. So here's where we're going to go. Daniel chapter 2 starts like this. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Would you pay attention? More than one. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. So they came to him, and they came in and stood before the king, and he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Okay, so here's what happens Nebuchadnezzar seems to be having sleepless nights. And there is this dream that keeps recurring. Maybe you've had that like, over and over again over the course of months. You have a very similar dream and it troubles you. You wake up. So he, this is happening to him. But we get the idea that when he wakes up, he forgets about the dream and he doesn't know what it is that's keeping him up. The first thing he asks in verse 2, he says he asked them to tell him what he had dreamed. So he knows that something's there. 
And he knows that it's the same thing night after night that is disturbing him, disrupting his sleep. He just doesn't know what the dream is. And so he pulls together what I'd like to call the dream team, okay? He pulls together his dream team, his sorcerers, his magicians, his uh, astrologers. And it seems like this is the group of people that is overseeing the three-year program that Daniel's on. That they're the wise men of Babylon. And he says, I, I need you to tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Now, Babylon had a sensitivity to dreams. They believed that truths were revealed through them, that the gods in their world would speak to people through dreams. Their way of interpreting it was kind of like case law. This is how it worked, okay? So if somebody important had a dream, they would write down the details of that dream. And then they would pay very close attention to the, to the months or even years that followed, and they would track history after that dream. And so, you know, if you only did that once, it would be hard. But if you did that several times, maybe even tens of times, then they would have a set of case studies that they could apply to future dreams. So, you know, if someone dreamed that they were falling and someone previously had had that kind of dream, and then these events happened, they'd go, well, that probably means that this is going to happen again. And they, they would have this rubric, this framework that would help them parse out the dreams of important people. Are you with me? But these, th this dream team can't apply that case study without knowing what the dream is. And so Nebuchadnezzar is asking them to do something that is, frankly, impossible. Tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what it means. So things progress all the way down in verse 10. It says, the astrologers answered the king. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. So they go, you're, you're asking us to read your mind, to see into your sleep. And they know enough to say only a, a God could do that. And then they, they confess the limitations of Babylon's gods. They go, our gods don't interact with people. They're wooden or stone or metal statues. They don't speak. They don't reveal. So we, we are powerless in this. They know something that Daniel's people know. And that there are times where dreams come from heaven, that God uses dreams to speak to people. I think there's something about our sleep state that lowers our defenses and that gives our minds greater access to the spiritual realm. I don't know exactly how it works, but I do believe that God even today can use dreams during the night to reveal truth to us. We also believe that during our sleep, we are more susceptible to the spiritual forces of evil. That's why I pray for the spirit of God to protect my family mentally and spiritually while we sleep, while we lower our defenses. And so God uses this as a way to reveal truth. But the dream team of Babylon is unable to know the dream and therefore interpret it. Verse 14. So here's what happens. Nebuchadnezzar is so angered through all of this. He's frustrated that he doesn't know his dream. He's exhausted, which puts us all in a bad spot, right? He's asked this team to tell him what he dreamed and they say they can't. And so he's escalating in anger and finally, he says, if you don't tell me what I dream, I'm going to kill you all. I'm going to execute all of the wise men, including the training program that has Daniel and his three friends in it. He commissions this man named Arioch to be the one who carries out the orders. It says, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to the king, spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree. Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel, and at this, Daniel went in to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel basically asks, he says, can, can you give me a little time? And he asks his friends to pray, and he waits. And I want to step aside from the, the, the current of this message for just a minute to say this. Daniel finds himself in an impossible situation. He is powerless. There, there are unreasonable threats and expectations being placed on him. 
And there are times where as followers of Jesus, we feel this, that we are in impossible situations. Maybe it's at work and how you need to navigate your faith. Maybe it's in your family and all the complexities of that. Maybe it's in the public space of social media and you feel like there's pressure or expectation or even threat placed upon people of Jesus. And it's hard to know how to react in those moments. And if only we could follow Daniel's example here, I feel like we might be people who defuse situations rather than escalate them. Daniel shows respect. He speaks with wisdom and tact. Daniel seeks prayer of his friends. He says, will you pray to the God of all mercy for this? And then he demonstrates confidence, not arrogance in himself, but confidence in the Lord that God's got this. I just think if, if when we find ourselves in difficult situations because of the culture we live in, if we would demonstrate the same respect, prayerfulness, and confidence in the Lord, that we might become people like Daniel of influence. People like Daniel who, who grow in the way that they can point people to their God. So Daniel says, I, I think I can do this. He seeks the Lord in prayer, and this is what happens. Verse 19, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. So God comes through. Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. He says, wisdom and power are his. He changes times in seasons as if he, human history has pages that the hand of God turns. He is sovereign over it all. He disposes kings and raises others up, meaning he's the one who lowers or humbles or removes kings and kingdoms, and he's the one who lifts them up. He alone gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals the deep and hidden things and knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells in him. Then Daniel says, I thank you and praise you, God. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So Daniel's got it. I mean, imagine the feeling, right? You wake up, you're like, oh my goodness. Like, I, I knew that God could, but he did, you know? And, and so now he can go to the king. So he appears before the king and the king presses him. Uh, when Daniel appears before him, the king says, can you do this? Are you able? And listen to Daniel's response. I love this. Verse 27 says, Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. And he's about to explain the dream. So he goes, no, I can't do this. No, no one could do this but God. Through me, my God. So in this land of Babylon, far from God, God is revealing through Daniel his wisdom and power. And he says, you were worried about the future. Daniel comments, you, you were up at night thinking about the things to come. He goes, God knew. And God wants you to be certain about the future too. So here's the dream. He says in verse 31, your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. And the statue, the head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze. Maybe that's where the term buns of steel came from. I'm not sure. <laughs> and its legs, iron its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. So well, I'm, before I move on, you got it, just a statue with different metals that are composing it. So gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then the feet are this weird mix of iron and clay. You with me? Like, so that's what, that's what Nebuchadnezzar just kept seeing in his vision. And it goes on. It says, while you were watching, a rock was cut out but not by human hands. This rock struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and it smashed them. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze and silver and gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor of the summer. That's, that's like the, the light part of the wheat that would blow away in the wind. It's like saying all these things came to, to dust, blown away in the wind. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay. 
So statue, rock, smash, dust, nothing, except a giant mountain. So that's, that's Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Cool, 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 right? So, so then Daniel takes a step and he goes, here's what it means. And it, th- this provides a stunning view of human history. Follow me for a minute. Daniel explains this. He goes, you Nebuchadnezzar, in 600 BC, God has given you glory and authority. You are the head of gold. You can just imagine kind of like, yeah, that's right. I'm the head of gold. That's cool. But he goes, but after you, which means your kingdom is going to end, after you is going to come another kingdom represented by the, the chest and arms of silver. And if you trace human history, 70 years after this moment, the Persian empire invaded and destroyed Babylon. This is Bab- uh, so, so this is the Persian empire. Then he, he moves down the statue and he goes, but then there's going to be another kingdom. And that kingdom is, is the, the belly and the legs of bronze. And, you go, and, and we know through human history, this was Alexander the Great and the, the Greek empire that took over. And then you move down just a little bit further and it's the legs of iron the Caesars of Rome that replaced the former empire. So you just walk through and there, there's this delineation that is very clear when you look at human history. You had the Babylonians and the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans, these four incredible kingdoms that are represented here. And then Daniel goes on to describe the rock. This is verse 44. He says, in the time of those kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. Not something to be passed on. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will in itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by a human hand, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. He goes, here's what's going to happen. Kingdom will pass on to kingdom. One will fall and another will rise. That will fall and another will rise. But in the course of human history, within this framework, the kingdom of God will come to earth. And it will overwhelm and overshadow every earthly kingdom. And it will be firmly rooted like a rock that cannot move. And it will grow and it will encompass the earth, meaning it's for all people everywhere. And nothing will ever tear it down. It will remain forever. Daniel says, this is the vision and this is the meaning and you can trust it. The king's response, and this is where the story ends, the king Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, paid him honor and ordered that an offering, an incense be presented to the king. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you were able to reveal this mystery to me. To the end of the story, is Nebuchadnezzar on his face, worshiping the God of Daniel. Now, to be clear, and we see this throughout the rest of the book, it's not as if Nebuchadnezzar abandoned all of his Babylonian gods to be wholly devoted to Israel's God. But what he knew is that Israel's God is different. Israel's God is above. Israel's God is sovereign. He is the Lord. He is God. This is an incredible vision that God chose to give first to Nebuchadnezzar and then to Daniel. There's a message buried in it that God wants his people to know. And so I want to walk through this and we're going to move pretty quickly here. But I believe that there are three truths from this vision that were needed back in that day and are needed in this day today. And I want you to follow them. My hope is that you'll write them down or at least remember them. And here's this, the first one, first truth from this story is that every human kingdom is fragile and temporary. Every human kingdom is fragile and temporary. So if you look at those great empires of antiquity, 
whether it's Babylon or Rome or Greece or Persia or any kingdom since, like they looked like the world power of their day. Their emperor, their king, their Caesar, their leader was the greatest, most powerful person in all of the world. And their citizens would have looked around and thought, I'm okay because I'm Babylonian. I'm okay because I'm Roman. Things are going to be good in the future because of this kingdom. And every single one of them fell crashing to the ground. I found a, a picture that I want you to see. This is the Mexican shellflower. Okay. Beautiful, right? So on any plant uh, of this kind, you'll see a bunch of different buds. But the amazing and unique thing about this plant in particular is that a bud will bloom sometime midday after the sun comes up. But by the time that the sun sets, the Mexican shellflower, by the time the sun sets, its flower will wither and die. Its bloom lasts only a day. And now there are other blooms on the plant, but that particular bloom comes and goes in a single day. The best of human kingdoms are like this. Their beauty is fleeting. Their power is vulnerable. Their security is fragile. And they will not last. That is what this dream is ultimately meaning, is that there is no kingdom, not Babylon or any to come, that will last forever. They are all fragile and they are all temporary. And it is so important that we shift from talking about old kingdoms to talking about kingdoms of today, that our kingdom, our nation, our, our country, anyone in the world is nothing more than a fragile and temporary kingdom. So if you are prone to putting hope, if you are prone to, to viewing our nation as strong and secure, then we've got to have this humble view that it is no better than all of the kingdoms that have come before that have risen and fallen under the sovereignty of God. Like this, this nation and this kingdom will not last. And if you are in this moment where you're like, yeah, no kidding, like because you feel like this is this fragile moment in our country, my question to you would be, is that because you see this kingdom or this country is fragile or because you see this administration is fragile? Like, would your thoughts about the security of our nation change if there was a different politician, party, or policy in place? Because the truth is that this nation and any nation will rise and fall. I want to take it a step closer to home, though. Um, one of the professors that taught Old Testament when I was in school wrote a commentary on the book of Daniel. And on this passage... He said this, we need not give only a political significance to this colossal statue. It can stand for our little empires, domestic, social, business, financial, or ecclesiastical, in the midst of which some of us sit enthroned, trying in vain to find security and satisfaction. It can stand merely for the image of our own future. So in the same way that governmental principalities come and go, the kingdoms that we give our lives to build will also come and go. Like we are all, whether we realize it or not, trying to build a little kingdom around us. There is a set of values that drive us, a set of desires for the future that we prioritize, whether it's for us or our kids. We are ordering our lives to build a kingdom. It could be your career. It could be your finances your reputation, your influence, your possessions, the sports future of your children. There is something that is ordering your life right now. And what this vision gives us is clarity that not only the nations and the kingdoms of this world will fall, but even the little kingdoms that we build around us are temporary and fragile. That just one little thing can happen that will change everything about our lives a diagnosis, an injury, a change in job status, unprecedented inflation, change in family relationships, the loss of a loved one, it all feels fragile. And I think in, in the core of our being, we know that, but we just can't let go of it. 
And so the whole idea here is that we would not put our hope in that which will not last. Because every human kingdom, whether it's the one that we are building or the one that is established around us, every human kingdom is fragile. So the other side of this, though, the second part of Daniel's vision is essential for us as well. Because not all hope is lost. Here's the second truth. That while every human kingdom is fragile and temporary, only God's kingdom is secure and eternal. That's the whole point of this. To this king who thought he was on top of the world, God is showing, hey, just so you know, my kingdom's coming. And it will wreck your kingdom. Like maybe the whole point here is that God's kingdom only comes where our kingdom falls. That there is this strange transfer What he's saying is that only his kingdom is secure and eternal. This isn't the only time that God's kingdom was described like a mountain. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The idea is that God will establish his kingdom as a mountain. What, what is more strong and secure than a mountain? Like it, it's immovable. So the image of a mountain represents permanence represents this eternal nature of God's kingdom. He says, he just, it, it won't let you down. So when Jesus came onto the scene, after he lived the first part of his life in relative obscurity, he starts to announce his message. And here it is in Mark chapter 1. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. What's the good news of God? Here it is. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He goes, you want to know what, what, what the good news of God is? You want to know the message that God is announcing? The time has come. It's the same message as in Daniel. In the time of those kings, in the flow of human history, while the, the statue was strong and secure, the kingdom of God came crashing in. I mean, the precision of this vision is really remarkable. Four kingdoms came and went, and during the kingdom of iron, kingdom of Rome, Jesus was born. In that empire, during the days of the Romans, Jesus lived his life perfectly. It was at the hands of the Romans that he was executed, and it was their very guards that disputed the resurrection because they couldn't wrap their minds around it but it was also under their nose that the kingdom of God began to spread. And despite the Romans' best efforts to murder and imprison Christians, they couldn't snuff it out. It took root and it continued to grow and multiply at an exponential rate so that by the end of the Roman kingdom, God's kingdom was all over the world. It came in and it could not be stopped just as God had predicted and promised. Jesus came to bring it, and he invites us into it. It's through his forgiveness that we enter. We look at his life to catch glimpses of it. His miracles show his power. Uh, We start to understand that it is his kingdom that heals and restores not only us, but our world. And there is absolutely nothing that can replace or defeat the kingdom of God. It is the antithesis to every human kingdom. And that's why we need to understand this final truth that comes out of this. This is what I believe God is wanting his people to hear from this vision. God wants you to put your hope in his kingdom alone. So think about this. There are only two people that saw this vision, right? And I believe that both people needed to see it. On the one hand, you have Nebuchadnezzar, full of power. And God is giving him this vision to say, don't misplace your hope because my kingdom is coming. No matter how strong and secure your kingdom feels right now, don't misplace your hope because my kingdom is coming. To Daniel, who had no power, 
no reason for hope, God gives this vision to say, I know your kingdom feels weak right now, but don't lose hope because my kingdom is coming. So whether your kingdom feels strong and secure or weak and fragile, God is saying, don't misplace or lose your hope because my kingdom is coming. So for you, I I don't know what your kingdom feels like right now. I don't know whether you look at it from a national perspective or a personal one, but here's the truth we've got to understand. Whether it's our country as a nation or whatever kingdom we are building around us, that is fragile and it cannot guarantee anything about your future. You cannot have certainty rooted in a human kingdom in regard to the future. But what we know is that the kingdom of God does the very thing that no human kingdom can. See, I think that part of the reason why we cling to the hope of a human kingdom is because it feels like in some way it will fix the brokenness of this world. We look across this world and we see injustice, we see immorality, we see racism and hatred and violence and division. We see economic despair and inequality and we go, man, something's got to fix this. And you are absolutely right in that. And so we hope that maybe the right policy, maybe the right party, the politician, maybe the right movement or cause can fix the brokenness, but they only address the symptoms. And any any one of those will make incremental advances in one area of brokenness while probably increasing the brokenness in another area. They cannot fix the root of the problem because the root of the brokenness in this world is sin that lives in the human heart. So the problem is never a system. It's never a culture. It's that every one of us have inclinations in our heart that push God away, that bring greed and dishonesty and manipulation and abuse of power into our world that introduce injustice and hatred and violence, that marginalize the weak, that overpower the minorities, that wield incredible harm to the people of this world. And there is no system, there is no human kingdom, as much as we wish there was, there's no human kingdom that can fix all of that which is why we need the kingdom of our God that breaks into this world to cure the problem where it starts, to forgive and remove sin, to begin to restore our hearts so they work properly again, so that instead of all of the sin and evil that flows from it, goodness and kindness and love and mercy and humility and peace and joy flow out of us into the world, that's what will fix it. And when God's kingdom comes, whether it's in our hearts or our homes or our homeland, when God's kingdom comes, nothing can root it out. That's why his kingdom is the only thing that is strong and secure. While every other kingdom is a bloom that comes and fades in but a day, God's kingdom is the rock that cannot be moved. And so God is urging his people then and now to put our hope in his kingdom alone. If your kingdom feels weak and fragile, don't despair, don't lose hope because God's kingdom is here and it is coming. If your kingdom is strong and secure and you look around and life is just what you want it to be, don't misplace your hope because God's kingdom is coming. It is his kingdom that we live for. See, if our kingdom, sorry, if our hope is in a human kingdom, get this, then this life is the best that there is and death is the end. But if our hope is in the kingdom of God, this life is as bad as it gets and death is just the beginning. We put our hope in that which is strong and secure, the kingdom of our God. And so I want to leave you with two questions. The first is this. I'm going to ask you to be honest about this. For those of you who are meeting in small groups this week for the first time, these are some of the questions that you will be wrestling through together. It says, how are you tempted to put hope in a human kingdom? 
Just be honest about that. Maybe it's yours. Maybe it's the one around you. But where do you feel this inclination to want to believe that the future is going to be okay because of this? And the second question is, how will it change your life to know that only God's kingdom will last? For those of you who've never made a decision to follow Jesus, you are living for a different kingdom. You are building a kingdom that will one day fall. But when you bow before his throne, when you declare your allegiance to him, when you let his word shape and guide your life, you enter a new reality under his authority that begins a kingdom in your life today that will only grow and endure, not just during this life, but for all eternity. And so we want to invite you week after week to respond. So if you've never believed in Jesus, if you've never crossed over to enter his kingdom, then belief in baptism is your response. And so I want to invite you during, during this next song, during our time of communion, to work through that and to ask the Lord if that is your next step. And if it is, we'll give you an opportunity to respond at the very end of the service. So I just want to pray over us right now. Father God, you know our hearts. I pray that if there are any who recognize that they have been living for a different kingdom, that you would convict and comfort that not all hope would be lost, but urgency would be gained to enter into your kingdom and live for that. Holy Spirit, you know that it is the cry of my heart that our people place their hope in you, in your kingdom. Yours is strong and secure. And yours alone. Spirit, do your work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to enter into a, a time of communion now, so I invite you, whether you're at home or here in the room, to go ahead and pull out those elements. You can open up the, uh, the cup and hold the bread. These elements remind us of the way into the kingdom. Jesus established his kingdom through his death and through his resurrection. It's how he paid for our sins so that we might be washed clean and given a place we do not deserve. And the way into his kingdom is not through power or force. It's through humility and death. It's where we say the life I once lived apart from you is no more. So that I can gain a life that you give to me. And so during the next minute, I want you to, uh, to take these elements. The bread, which remembers his body. The juice, which remembers his blood. And while you do this, think not only of his death that secured this life for you but also yours, the laying down of your life for Jesus, your King. We invite you to do that now. We invite you to stand and just let this be used as long as we're
just a minute. 
I was lonely last time I was up here, so I'm going to invite some of my friends to come up. Um, this is an exciting day. Uh, as you know, Bridgepoint has been through uh, several staff transitions over the last year, and uh, we get to introduce you to some new staff today. Uh, so I'm on stage with Ezekiel to my far, my far right, your left, and Ezekiel's been on the team for about a year, a little bit more than that, as the director of ministry, and we have two new staff members who have been on the team for a week, and they're still here, which is great, right? And so um, before we introduce them to you and share what they'll be doing, I just want to say thank you to you all. Um, this church is absolutely amazing. Uh, you know that we have been through a lot as a people over the last couple years, and through all of it, uh, and including the, the recent just financial instability of our country, you guys have been so generous, and it is really that continued generosity that has laid the foundation for us to be able to make these moves. Yes, it really is, and I just want to thank each of you that has chosen to help to strengthen the church, uh, because because of you, we're really in a stable position financially, and what that allows us to do is when we have staff transitions, we can really just focus our time on finding the right people to help fill the roles, and also just allows our ministry leaders to be able to focus on caring for people, to focus on equipping people, and really just helping them to grow as disciples of Jesus, so thank you. Yeah, amen. Amen. Um, yeah, give yourselves a round of applause. That's a big deal. Um, so uh, we have been in the process of uh, searching for a, a student ministry director for several months now, and, uh, and we've conducted interviews, and so it is my joy to introduce to you Nelson uh, as our new student ministry director. Isn't that exciting? I, I love love getting to raise people up from within the body, the, the family of God here, to new ministry roles. And um, as we started to search for this, Nelson actually approached us and said, hey, th this role really causes my heart uh, to beat fast. This is something I really care about. And Nelson uh, is a townie, grew up in EP, right? He said, e if I didn't start bleeding red, I'd bleed red. Um, anyway, um, and so he, he went to the same middle school that my daughter is currently in. Uh, so his heart for EP and the surrounding areas is strong, and he is super excited to start to build a ministry that will grow over many years. And so parents, if you, are, uh, if you currently have a middle school or high school student, or maybe you have younger kids that will be there in a couple years, I, I have three kids. I am so excited for Nelson to lead the team that will provide this ministry for our kids to grow up as disciples of Jesus. I'm just super pumped. Glad to have you on team. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. And I get to introduce to you all Aracel Sikal. Uh, Aracel, yeah. uh, Aracel is our new hospitality director. And uh, Aracel and her family have been uh, calling Bridgepoint home since February. And uh, since she came in, she just really jumped right in. She has a heart to serve, and she's been serving as part of our BP Kids team. Uh, before they came here to Bridgepoint, she served for many years at Iglesia de Cristo, Agua de Vida in Riverside. And uh, so she just has a passion for serving, and I know that she is excited to be able to serve you all more in this expanded role. So welcome. Yeah. We immediately started noticing changes in the Bridgepoint office as soon as Sally showed up. Like, Second day, it's starting to smell better. Uh, things were organized, but like we are super excited for her to do her work of hospitality, both in the office and for the church. So just thrilled about that. Um, as we wrap up our service today, I want to say this, because this, I, I would love for you to take a moment just to walk over and meet one of these new staff members. Introduce yourself, let them know that you are glad that they are here. Um, and they're going to need to lean on the church as well as they uh, move into their new roles um, for parents. Um, both kids and students. Uh, our kids and student groups start this Wednesday at 6.30. 6.30, not 7, so there's a little bit of confusion about that. 6.30, uh, 6.30 to 8, uh, they coincide, so same times for both. And we would love your help to get your students there. I believe in this. I, I believe that this is part of what creates that strong foundation for the next generation. And, uh, and especially with, um, with middle school, high school students and parents, will you go out of your way to just introduce yourself to Nelson? He wants to know you. He wants to build strong relationships with your kids. He wants to see the kingdom come here in East Providence. And so please let that begin today as we form a strong partnership. All right, uh, let's go ahead and stand and, uh, and pray together. 
Um, as we conclude our service, we're going to have our prayer team down here. If there's anything you need prayer over, please let them know. If you feel the Spirit moving you toward a decision to follow Jesus, do not leave this place without responding. Let us pray with you and talk with you. If you're brand new, stop by Next Steps. we got a little gift we'd like to give you to say hi. And uh, church, we love you. Father God, thank you so much for this day. I pray that you would send us out on mission. I know that there are people near each of us who are ready to take just one step closer to Jesus. Make us people who build momentum in their lives by the way that we speak and live and depend on your mighty power. And I pray that you would move people close to us, closer to Jesus. In his mighty name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll see you, church. I love you, man. Excited.